Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first webinar of the new year. We, the Islandor Foundation is joined today by Seth Shaw from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, he's been involved with Islandora since uh, about 2018 when they first started exploring it as an option to migrate to. And Seth is going to take us through um, that migration path, what they're doing with Islandora, the neat things they've built for Islandora. And we will hold some time at the end for questions um, and demos, if you like. All right, so Seth, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, so yes, yeah, so this presentation is going to be talking about our road to adopting Islandora 8. Uh, so let's state, set the stage a little bit. So in 2017, our digital collections and special collections online presence was set up um, according to this diagram, really. We had a database that described our archival collections, which was homegrown PHP MySQL um, application online that we had used for uh, several years. But then uh, special collections adopted archive space uh, around 2015, if I remember correctly, but before I got here. And they started using it to produce PDFs um, to post to link to the database, but that was about it that they had for providing online access to archival descriptions. Now, digital collections um, in special collections have been digitizing uh, portions of collections for years and years and years. Uh, they had been placing their content initially in a locally hosted instance of content DM, uh, but in 2017, OCLC uh, forced us onto uh, the cloud uh, version of content DM. Um, a lot of those collections that we were digitizing and putting online were funded through grant projects. And to showcase uh, these digitization projects, we would create websites to highlight the materials and put them in context, et cetera, et cetera, um, which ended up in a pile of both static uh, HTML uh, exhibit sites, but also some exhibit sites in a Drupal instance that we called uh, digital.library.unlv.edu. And so when you went to look for special collections materials, uh, there was three different places you could go. You could go to Content DM, you could go to the exhibit site, you could go to our collections database, which um, we included these little search <laughs> URLs that you could click on that would produce a canned search in Content DM to show some related digitized items from that. But the experience was a bit scattered. Um, also, in the move to the hosted Content DM, we lost some of our local customizations of Content DM. Uh, so we had some social engagement things, some other uh, bits and features, which the hosted version just couldn't support and that we just lost. So for a while, we have wanted to have a replacement to Content DM uh, for a number of reasons. And so when I came on uh, mid-2017, so I started here July of 2017, I was told, okay, let's figure out a path away from what we're doing right now. And I was essentially given two goals. Uh, one, a new repository for public access to be the replacement of content DM, but also one that we could support some preservation actions around. Uh, granted, preservation, um, depending on how you want to define it or scope it, means many different things but we wanted something that could be the basis for preservation actions moving forward. Uh, controlling our redundancy, uh, doing fixity checking, et cetera, et cetera, uh, moving from there. But we also wanted to start pulling things together, making sure that we had our archival description uh, site available with links to those digital objects, right? Because we had a collection level description and that collection could do a can search to things. But if you were in a finding aid and were looking at a particular series or subseries or photograph in the description, um, we at that time had no way of jumping to the corresponding digitized item online. 
Uh, we've resolved that with the PDF since then, uh, but still it's a bit clunky going from a PDF to the uh, website. And you also couldn't go from the digital object directly to uh, the archival component in the finding aid either. So we wanted to bring the archival description online in such a way that we could link these things together uh, so people could see these things in context to each other. We also had some parallel projects going at the same time. Um, we had no fewer than five different places where you could find a person described in our systems between the catalog, archive space, content DM, uh, some linked data work that we were doing. And so this would result in where we would have a person described and the preferred form of name, uh, which could potentially get out of sync uh, depending on how things were being managed. And so we wanted to find a way to streamline that a bit. Uh, we had also been uh, pursuing some linked data. We had a proof of concept uh, called the Navigator uh, that allowed us to create relationships between people and organizations and materials um, that were rather robust using linked data uh, references. And we wanted to build that linked data capability into this new system as well. And so these were all the ideas that we had that we wanted to incorporate in this new online presence for special collections and uh, digital collections within that. But I didn't want to just jump into something. We needed to figure out what the most appropriate solution would be for our institution. So I um, started asking, being a new person to the organization, four questions about how we wanted this system to be going. Uh, first of all, did we want to focus more in local development, something that would be ours, or did we want to focus on community development? Now there's a saying that goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And this is also an instance where we've had uh, locally developed projects burn out because we had the local developer leave and no one else knew how to work with it. Um, and it was very, very particular to our local instance. Um, we weren't interested in repeating that. We wanted something that even if we would make some local customizations, the core of it would be something that the community was developing together. Uh, and that we could also contribute back to. Uh, so we knew we wanted something, um, an open source solution that we could work with. The second question is, did we want to rely on existing expertise or adopt some new ones? Um, so after we had answered that first question, we had landed on, we wanted to do something with Fedora. Um, and the two major options were the Samvera and the Islandora. Um, options for providing a front end to it because uh, we didn't want to develop our own front end to Fedora. So we had to consider what expertise did we have in house. Uh, our library is situated within the university. All our websites are Drupal, right? The, the university's website is Drupal. The library's main website is Drupal. Our existing uh, digital exhibits site was Drupal. Our developers in-house not only had Drupal experience, but general PHP development experience. And so going with Islandora, which focused on Drupal, made sense. Uh, no one here had any Ruby experience at all. Um, I made it clear to the organization at the time that if this is the one we want, I can, I'll learn Ruby and we can have someone else in the department learn Ruby but there is going to be that curve of trying to work within that new environment. And so we decided, well, let's stick with what we know, <laughs> which is Drupal, and that steered us towards using Islandora. Uh, the next question that really needed to be addressed was how quickly did we need this done? Uh, did we need to do this uh, by the end of 2017? Did we have some time that we could spend because at that time in 2017, the main install version of Islandora was Islandora 7. 
And I knew that uh, Drupal 7 and Fedora 3 were both reaching end of life. And I didn't want to jump into a new site and then have to turn around and re-implement it again in whatever the successor would be uh, a year or two later. So I wasn't keen on just jumping in there. If I had the time to spend, I preferred taking that time and getting um, Islandora Claw, which is what it was called at the time, uh, what would be Islandora 8, up and running to a level uh, that we could adopt it here um, and move forward with it. And I did get the administrative buy-in from that, saying, hey, let's just focus our energy on helping the community move forward and move up and get to this new uh, site. So that's what we decided to do. I started working uh, with getting the um, Islandora Claw playbook running at the end of 2017 and beginning of 2018 and helping get it up and out the door. The fourth question we had was how tightly did we want to couple our digital collections interface with our archives interface? So we could have done an Islandora 8 for the digital collections and uh, adopted the newly revamped archive space public user interface um, and just create links between the two, which would have been fine. Uh, it would have worked. It's a bit more challenging to get those two to uh, the two interfaces to match perfectly, uh, depending on the different constraints you have, but it was something that we could do. Uh, on the other hand, we could see if we could bring our archival descriptions into our Islandora instance and more tightly integrate everything together. And when I presented that as an idea to the administration, they said, that sounds great. We like things being uh, integrated together. Let's get away from these silos. So this is what we planned to do. Of course, you know, plans don't always uh, <laughs> necessarily work out exactly like you expected to, but this was our planned architecture at that point, where Drupal 8 would be the main site that all of our users would go to. Uh, they wouldn't have to go to three different places to find their content. Um, it would all be through this Drupal interface. This is also good for search engine optimization because Google doesn't have to get confused about which site it should be sending people to. Uh, in that Drupal, you have that connection between Drupal 8 and Fedora, which is your Islandora connector right here. And then we would also be bringing in the archive space descriptions via the API. Uh, staff would still continue processing and describing collections in archive space. We're not getting rid of it. We are keeping it uh, because it's good for what it does, describing our collections. Uh, we just want to bring those descriptions into Drupal so that we could tightly integrate with our search and with our display. Uh, that stated, we knew that if we're replacing, oops, go back. If we were replacing Content DM, one of the things that we would lose is the Content DM project client, uh, which is, for those of you who don't know, a desktop application that allows you to upload a bunch of images and then make uh, bulk metadata edits and then uh, QC those edits and then publish those edits to your content DM site. And we wanted something that would um, allow us to do that with our descriptions before we upload into our Drupal instance. Um, and that's in dotted lines because we knew we would have to create that. Um, and I, I will come back to this later. Uh, we will eventually get to integrating Archivematica to bring in our born digital content here as well. And we are pushing uh, Preservation Masters to an Amazon Glacier, although this line ended up going from Fedora rather than from Drupal. But the point is we did want that redundancy um, in Amazon Glacier. So how are we gonna do this massive task? Uh, we broke this out into essentially three stages where stage one, 2018, was going to be stabilize Islandor 8. <laughs> Get it to a point where we could install it and run it. 
Um, and of course, at the same time, work on uh, content modeling. What metadata fields were we going to have in Drupal? What content types were we going to have? Um, all that jazz. Uh, how are we going to bulk load content in here? Because we have more than a decade worth of, maybe even two decades, uh, I think closing on two decades worth of digitized content that we would need to load. We're not going to point and click through the web interface to load two decades of digital content in here. We need to be able to bulk, bulk load it. Uh, get the fixity auditing uh, worked out, and also figure out our strategy for backup to Amazon. Stage two is all going to be about those interfaces and integrations. So bringing in the archive space content, the user interface design, the OAI PMH endpoint for, um, so we're members of the Mountain West Digital Library, making sure that they can harvest our content. Also the library's catalog can also harvest from that endpoint as well to make it searchable in the library catalog. Of course, the bulk metadata editor, the content DM project client replacement, and also whatever workflow improvements we wanted to make to that process. And we said anything else, <laughs> stage three, will be after that, right? Uh, born digital collections and any other uh, cool things we think up along the lines that would come after this. So how did it go? That's where we wanted to go. How did it go? Stabilizing Islandora uh, Claw to eight. Um, 2018 was interesting um, because Islandora Claw was in this very alpha early development stages. There was a lot of shifting going around. Um, we ha were previously using the rules module. We shifted to the context module, which opened up a lot of power. Um, we shifted the fact that nodes were referencing media to the other way around, to media referencing nodes. And also, uh, this was the big one for me, the thing that was really, I really, really wanted before we actually moved forward with it, uh, fly system, which before fly system was introduced, you had a copy of all of your digital files in Drupal and a copy of all your stuff in Fedora. And so we had a lot of redundancy there um, but Fly System allowed us to push our masters directly into Fedora and allowed Drupal to talk to Fedora uh, for our binaries, which was a great improvement, I believe. Um, there was also a number of sprints, you know, helping. Now that we had this new ar architecture um, near the end of uh, August, uh, in September, how do we start getting people into Claw? Now, we didn't have an Islandora 7 for the sprint, but... I had been working with bulk loading um, for months at this point. And so I contributed to uh, that migration sprint, helping figure out the different migration features that you could use to pull stuff over. Documentation and testing, just to get this thing out the door. That's what we were trying to do. So that we could have that initial public release in June, 2019. So granted this was into 19 rather than the 18 timeline I had, but hey, we got it going, we got it working, uh, but it didn't end there. We're still shaking out bugs and adding new features. That, that's what we do as we move forward. So now that we had an Islandora 8 that we could use and build on, we had to move forward with our own work on that. Uh, content modeling, which in Drupal 8 terms is a whole lot of config. Right. It's a lot of configuration files <laughs> to define your fields and how things are going to be structured and work. Um, and a little bit of code. Now, I should note that because I knew the Islandora 8 and our archive space integration were going to be set technically two separate things, um, but they would both need to model the same uh, subjects, people, or agents, uh, people, corporate bodies, families, uh, geographic locations, those things that I didn't want to just segregate those into one or the other. So we created controlled access terms to be a shared module that both projects could use uh, independent of each other um, so that we didn't have redundancy between those two. So the controlled access terms module is used to define uh, the vocabularies for persons, families, corporate bodies, subjects, and we've geographic locations, and we've added some since then as well. 
the community, I'll clarify, the community out of those um, moving forward. Because you know, under my, my scheming was that I didn't want to have to maintain this myself. <laughs> so I said, hey, I live to our community. I built this thing. I think it could be useful to you. Would you consider taking it on? And uh, the community felt that it was appropriate. And so it was adopted, which was great because it meant I got some support in maintaining this thing. Um, uh, complex, so we also had to implement, of course, our own metadata profile, our own fields that we have uh, specified by our metadata librarian um, and implement that uh, locally, which again, wasn't terrible. It was mostly a bunch of configs. Um, and also, how are we gonna do complex objects? Uh, well, it turns out with Islandora 8, the fact that we have that field member of field to create a relationship between two entities already, that plus views is pretty much all I need to do my complex objects, um, which has been great. Uh, there's been, you know, adding a weight field and a few other bits have made it uh, better, uh, but by and large, that's all we really needed. Uh, bulk loading. Uh, Drupal 8 includes this powerful feature called the Migrate API, which allows you to do a lot of your bulk loading uh, configuration through lots more configs. You know, it's Drupal 8. It's going to be a config more often than not. Um, but also a little bit of code. Uh, the Migrate API has a lot of things that it can do to transform your data as it comes in, uh, but not it didn't have everything that met our needs. So we created a few small plugins uh, locally to do some transformations. So in Content DM, the way you do date ranges is to just list all the dates, semicolon delimited. That's what you do. Um, but we are now using a standard called um, Extended Date Time Format, or EDTF, which is being adopted into the ISO date standard. So we needed to transform this serialized list of dates into a single date expression. So I built a plugin that says, hey, if you see this semicolon delimited string, transform it. Uh, they're fairly simple. If you want to chat with me about doing those later, I'm happy to chat about that later. Um, of course, doing this early on, being an early adopter means I was testing things and breaking things. So I reported the issue. Um, as a scalability issue, uh, through the great help of uh, Danny Lamb and Jared Wicklow, we were able to figure out the core thing that was causing the problem and it got fixed. Yay for community development, rather than just trying to do it on our own. And if you do want to know more about bulk loading, uh, I did give a presentation at IslandoraCon. There's the uh, slides that talk about how you can use the Migrate API for that. Again, I'm happy to chat with you later as well. So the archive space Drupal integration that we were working on. Um, keep in mind, this is nothing tied to Island or 8. Uh, this is just archive space in Drupal. So you don't need an Island or a site to use this. Um, but it follows a similar pattern as what we did with building on Island or 8. You define some content, you figure out how to do synchronization, you create some views and maybe do some theming. Uh, and so that's all this really is, is I've defined some Drupal content models that uh, mirror the archive space fields. Um, and I set up a Drupal 8 uh, migrate API. I did have to do, it wasn't just configs because there wasn't always a one-to-one -one exact mapping because of how archive space creates their JSON structures um, and their REST architecture. So I, did have to build a plugin to define how the migrate API should talk to archive space and also uh, the configs to do some mapping with additional uh, transformation uh, plugins as well. Um, and then creating some the uh, views. So in archive space, a, you have an archival resource, which is your collection level description, and all the components underneath are archival objects. Well, each of those become their own node in uh, this integration. And so if you want to create an inventory, well, you build a view, right? 
So I have a resource that says, hey, look for all of the children and put it into a table. Um, and then you can do some uh, theming on, on top of that. And if you're interested, there is the Drupal project. It is an alpha release right now, um, in part because it's just what we use. Um, and I'm dealing with the things that I see. Uh, but if other people want to play with it and give some feedback, I'm happy to turn this into a release candidate and perhaps a 1.0 version. Um, it, is, it is ready for at least us to use. Maybe it's ready for you to use. Uh, let me know and we can make that work. Um, it also means that getting all of your archive space content in there is once you plug in your username and the API endpoint and your password, um, all it is is a migrate. So you can tell uh, your migrate API, just migrate my corporate bodies, migrate my families, migrate my people, and it will do them. It will even tell you the last time you imported and how many are unprocessed from uh, that point. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to run these migrations on a periodic basis, uh, probably weekly initially, just to see how it goes. Most of these run really fast. Uh, the one that takes a long time, as you can probably guess, is the archival objects, because we have over 200,000 uh, series, subseries, files um, in our archive space instance. That takes a long time, if nothing else, just to crank through all of the requests to see what's changed. Oh, but it's fairly uh, simple to use. Um, composer install, do your config, run your migrate. And then you get something like this. Um, I've created a initial view from our uh, new site's uh, front page that's archival collections. Uh, you click on the link and it gives you a table view of your archival resources. Um, you can sort it by the identifier or the title. Um, dates and extent sorting don't work yet because of the peculiarities of those fields, but that is a uh, future um, feature to come. Um, it just hasn't been high enough on the priority list to get it uh, those sorts working correctly. But identifier and title, you could also put a filter on here so you could do a simple keyword search for Hughes and show all the collections that are relating to Howard Hughes, et cetera, et cetera. But if you click on one of these, um, you'll see the standard archival description. You will get breadcrumbs. So the Howard Hughes Professional Aeronautical Photographs uh, collection, the Howard Tools Company and Hughes Aircraft Company photographs, 1917 to 1997 um, series, right? And here's the description of the series and of course its own inventory, which is a view. Uh, one of the things that I did add to this view is um, my linking to my Islandora objects. Um, if, if it's available online, it's available online column. You can click on the identifier for it. Um, in this case, we're just gonna click on uh, Howard Hughes approximately 1997 to 1998, and you have the archival description of the thing. But it also has a link to the digital object, which is great in case Drupal dropped them straight on this page. Uh, we can click on it and move on. Um, I should note that the UI is still in development. So yes, it still looks ugly. <laughs> this is not final. It is in development right now. Um, but if you click on the available online, or if you had gone back to that inventory and clicked on the digital object link, uh, here is the photograph of Howard Hughes with its date, its description, physical identifier, our uh, persistent identifier for it. We also have a download link for the master which is something that we didn't have in content DM. Uh, if previously, if someone wanted a uh, publication worthy image of that from our content DM, they would have to email our public services and they'd have to clarify which image they wanted. Then public services would have to look up the digital identifier and they go into our file server and look up the file and get it and return it to the individual, right? It was this whole big process uh, to get someone a reproduction uh, quality image. Now, they can just download the TIFF straight from the page, uh, which 
uh, we think is a wonderful feature uh, for them to have. They also have um, the subjects, time periods, and this is a screenshot so you can't scroll down, but I can show you the full page uh, later during demo time. If you click on Howard Hughes, um, it will go to a Howard Hughes page with his preferred name, birth date, death date, relationships. So he's a member of the Hughes Aircraft Company. Um, we have whole families that we have spouses and children, and we've built out those relationships that you can navigate those relationships in the UI. And of course, we have another view to say, here's some of the stuff uh, that's associated with this person in case you landed directly on Howard Hughes uh, from your Google search. Um, again, this still needs to be cleaned up uh, for the UI. We're still working through that. So you might be wondering, why have two separate records? Uh, why have an archival object description, which is pictures on the left, and another digital collections um, image on the right? Uh, a few things. First, this is mostly due to historical past practices, uh, where, like in archive space, you have the archival object and you have a digital object record. You have them both, um, but you don't have to. You could take this archival object content type and just add like a single field right now and update a few configurations, and it all of a sudden becomes your island door object. Um, we are going to consider. Uh, moving to that model later and consolidating. Uh, we have not decided finally what we're going to do, but we're going to stick with this for now because it's more consistent with what we're doing. Um, of course, the problem is that you have two search results. So if you search MoBots on our site, you have both the archival object and you have the, con uh, the digital object result, um, as noted by the facets here, which again, facets look ugly. We are fixing that. Um, but it does require you to you know, filter out some duplicated results. You might be wondering how we get these things linked uh, currently. Uh, so this is before we've even implemented uh, the dams for public viewing. Um, we export an EAD from archive space. We transform it into a spreadsheet using um, an XSLT. We update that spreadsheet during digitization spreadsheet is loaded, and then we bring that back into archive space using content DMs funded out of exports, and we do an export of the PDF. So it's this laborious progress uh, to get things um, back and forth. And the repository, what we're able to do is we're able to, as long as we've digitized it with that reference ID, um, the import will just look it up and link it. Right? Simplifying our workflows as much as possible uh, we would like to be able to just select things in Drupal that we want to digitize, have that export the spreadsheet that we want to edit, and then re-upload, which will create those links. Um, we are working on a batch metadata editor. I would have liked this to have at least had a beta by the end of December this past year, um, but priorities got shifted. Um, this has a alpha working version. It does kind of work, uh, but it could use a lot of improvements. But uh, shout out to Mark Jordan, who's been uh, doing a lot of good work with his Islandora Workbench Python tool, um, and us both trying to get this up and running and out the door. But one of the nice features about this is in your editor, um, it will auto load drop downs with fields from your archives from your Drupal site. So if you have a resource type field, it'll say, hey, I know this thing has these defined uh, values that are uh, taxonomy terms. Let me populate a dropdown for you. Uh, Fixity and OIPMH. Uh, shout out to the community. Again, Mark Jordan, uh, Joe Curl uh, from Kent State have helped us as a community move these things forward. Um, once these were announced that people were working on them. I jumped on the bandwagon and said, hey, I want this feature too. Let me try to help. Uh, so I did provide some feedback to the RipRap to improve that one. I provided some uh, assistance with the RISO IPMH project as well to get that going out the door. And uh, we are happy to be adopting those and working with them locally. So are we ready to go? It is the end. 
it is now 2000, uh, 2020. We should be ready to launch. Well, not quite. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I was hoping to use the Islandora 1.1 release, but we are just going to go with dev for now because we're just heading forward. Uh, but metadata remediation. We have like two decades worth of description. Uh, as if you were living in an apartment or a house for 20 years and decided to move to a new house and start packing up your stuff and realize you have a big mess to clean up. We had a big mess to clean up. <laughs> so uh, we decided that we were going to spend that elbow grease before going live to clean up a lot of that metadata as we move forward. So we did shift our public release deadline to the end of June, uh, in part to give us more time to clean up metadata. Uh, we are also going to be doing some user experience design and testing. Um, and we are working on it. It's incomplete, as you saw, but we are uh, actively working on it. In fact, one of those screenshots is now up to, out of date because I fixed it uh, from that point. And of course, a project client uh, does need more work. So it's been a quite the journey. It's been a lot of fun. I really, really, really appreciate the community. The community has been great to work with. Sometimes a bit slow. Sometimes a PR can sit around for a while and uh, without a review before it gets merged, but it eventually happens and we move forward together and it's been great. Um, so we are moving forward. We're almost there. Uh, our target, our new target is the end of June and uh, feel free to chat with me about whatever you need. Uh, questions, that you have, ha, questions you might have. Bit of a whirlwind, but uh, I can take some questions if anyone has any. And we can take those questions either by voice or you can type into the chat and I'll, uh, I'll read it out for Seth. Uh, there is one that came up during uh, a few minutes ago while you're presenting your, your archive space bit. Um, someone asks to clarify the integration with archive space is one directional data only coming from archive space into Islandora. That is currently correct. We are only pulling data from archive space into uh, the repository. Um, in the archive, I should clarify with the archive space uh, integration uh, module that's on Drupal, there is an optional sub module that will also ingest digital objects as they're described in archive space. We are not using that locally uh, because we're, we're only describing our digital objects in our island or instance, we are not pushing those back to archive space. Uh, the other place that you might want to push it back is the controlled access terms where you update a person because we're ro more robust in our, in well, okay, there's give and take. There's some things that we can do in the um, in island or eight that we can't do in archive space and currently vice versa for uh, taxonomy terms. So we have not been pushing anything back to archive space. We are simply pulling data from archive space. But in most cases, that's how we want it anyway. Uh, because we don't want to have changes in our Island Dora site to archival descriptions, uh, overwrite the descriptive work that someone's doing in archive space. Um, and archive space has its own locking features for doing that. That's not to say that you couldn't do it. Because archive space does have a REST API, and I can teach Islandora to update archive space. We just haven't done it. Um, the other thing that we would like to do with the archive space integration is create a plugin to archive space that has a publish button on it. So that when you hit publish on a archival description, it simply right away updates the Islandora instance. Um, that's going to be later on. We don't know when we'll get to it but we would like to see, we would like to make that happen. Next question is, is there a demo for us to see? Well, I can show you something if you would like. Let me pull this up in here. Uh, so one of the things to note is that we are taking our existing digital site and inserting Islandora onto it. So like some sites that, you know, take a default Islandora and build off of it, we're doing 
uh, a different tactic where we were taking an existing Drupal site and bringing our stuff on our island door up pieces onto it. So a lot of the theming and the UI work, um, we already have past theming that we're inheriting uh, that doesn't necessarily work with the island door, island door bits we're bringing in, which is why you know the facets don't look that great or a few other things look wonky, is because we need to adjust the existing theming to account for our island door bits. And so, uh, for example, if you wanted to see, well, we'll just search. Um, we did, let's do the spruce goose, which for those of you that don't know is a nickname uh, for the Hughes uh, Hercules jet. Um, that was done during the war effort made out of spruce instead of aluminum because we had wood and not much uh, aluminum. Uh, we have a whole bunch of archival descriptions that talk about the Spruce Goose, but we're probably more interested in the digital objects right now. So I'm going to click on our digital object facet, which we're going to clean up. And so now you can see photographs of uh, things that are related to the Spruce Goose, uh, which is probably one of my uh, favorites here. And uh, so let's go to the photographic construction of the Spruce Goose. Circuit of the state. Uh, one thing to note is that this date in the database is the EDTF. So it would be 1995 slash 1947. But we have a display plugin um, that says, hey, I don't want to have the EDTF format. I want to insert a two between the two dates uh, for end users. So that, that's that description. We do have our two different tabs with all the different information that we have about it. Um, we are, uh, Catherine put in the chat box, we are using Fedora uh, as the backend storage. So we have this turned on right now. This will not be on in production. Uh, this will be firewalled off in production. But we are having Fedora in the backend. Here's the photograph with the bibliographic citation, dates, identifiers, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, uh, the binary would also be linked from here as well. Um, but if you are interested in more about uh, the photograph collection, the collection level is described right here, but this is the archival object. They can go straight to where this photograph came from. Uh, if you want to know, see more stuff from the 40s, you can do that. Or we can just go to the Hughes HK1 Hercules uh, more info is things like citations, rights, date digitized, extent, et cetera, et cetera. So there's the Hercules HK1 flying boat. So you can see all those. Of course, if you can go up to the source, HK1 Hercules, there's a link back to the digital object um, and then the archival uh, context of where it came from. Uh, and if people want to see something particular, uh, feel free to uh, put a comment and I can try to show you something in particular. Uh, but Matt was asking, am I using Ansible for deployment? How do you plan to push updates? That's a good question. So we have taken the Island or playbook and we've switched some things around um, to where we now have a split server setup to where we have our public side that has the Drupal instance and has our uh, cantaloupe running on Tomcat, which are public facing. And everything else, uh, like Fedora and the microservices and our carafe um, and all those bits are living on the firewall protected uh, backend server. The backend server is almost straight up the original uh, playbook, right? Uh, with, of course, variables changed, passwords changed, obviously. Um, and then, but because the existing uh, Drupal site was an existing site, we decided not to do those Drupal end pieces using Ansible. Uh, that is a more manual process uh, to do that. 
So updates to like the backend pieces will be Ansible updates, right? We'll say, hey, things have been pulled in. Let's push things out. Um, if things have updated on the Island Dora side, uh, we'll use the standard Git uh, strategies of doing uh, pulls and merges locally. Um, this is a, oh, sorry. sorry. There's a new question in chat asking how Arc of Matica work with Islandor or how will Arc of Matica work with Islandor to support your born digital collections? That is a great question, and that is to be determined. That I have some ideas, but we have not committed to anything because we're simply trying to get content DM replaced first, um, and then I can start exploring what we would like to do with the Archive Matica integration. The theory is right now is that our um, archival staff will use Archive Matica. They will uh, submit the born digital materials to the Archive Matica. It'll go through its workflow and we will either take the AIP that they create, that Archive Matica creates, and use that as the basis for our um, migrate connection or we might create a, um, a new uh, Archive Matica uh, plugin uh, to talk to it directly. We're not exactly sure, but we are going to use Archive Matica for what it's good for, which is the whole uh, workflow routine. And it's at the end of that pipeline, we will push things into our Island Door instance. Next question is, what do you use for your digital scholarship collections? Okay, so by that, I'm assuming you mean things like uh, institutional repositories, like faculty scholarship, um, electronic theses and dissertations, etc. So our IR is currently using BPress. And when we started this project, we had a conversation with them saying, hey, we're going to be doing this. Um, how do you want to integrate with this? Do you want to integrate with this? What, what should the timeline be? And the answer was, well, we are happy with Depress right now. So don't worry about us for now. That stated, we are not ruling out the possibility of importing their content later uh, should we decide that that's necessary. So that, again, is one of those future past phase three, we'll, we'll get our born digital stuff taken care of first. If there ever becomes an emergency around Depress that we have to get out now, um, I feel relatively confident that we'd be able to accommodate that fairly quickly um, if we needed to ship that priority. But right now it's Depress. Our IR folks are happy with it for now. So we're going to keep status quo for the time being at least. Um, it's also an open question whether or not we bring them into this new dance itself or set up a separate instance. Uh, that is also a separate question, uh, which we may potentially do. Do we have any more questions? Are you planning on providing public Sparkle endpoint? We are. In fact, my, um, <laughs> my metadata librarian is like, Seth, you have to prioritize this. Get this out like now. Um, I want my Sparkle endpoint. So yes, we're going to do that. Um, and so I, I'm not, we would like to have that by the end of June, right? Um, the key right now is that we're not exactly sure how we are going to populate the uh, public one versus the private one on the back because we are going to have some content that is restricted in this repository that only special collection staff can see. And right now, um, all of that information would get pushed to that triple store. Um, there's an open ticket for being able to do this, I think. Um, if not, I had meant to create one and didn't uh, to do a separate one, but that is certainly on my list of things to do um, to get a public one that is only the link data that we've determined 
doesn't have any restrictions. Another question is, do you have any compound or paged content that you can show us here? So on this site, I can't, and I'll also note if anyone's looking at the URL, this is our development site, not the eventual production site. Um, and this one does not have the paged content theming in place yet. Um, that has all been done locally on my personal machine. And um, that version is not in sync with the current uh, development site, generally speaking. Um, let me see actually really quick, since we have a moment, if I have anything similar uh, to it set up. Because I may have some of the views set up, but they probably aren't themed the way I want them to be yet. Um, and also, this has only been loaded. Ah, actually, let me think really quick. We are taking multiple strategies for complex objects. Uh, for page content. One of the things that we're doing is that for uh, paginated text documents, we are generating PDFs. And so even though each of those uh, individual pages does have the, their own page in the repository, we don't expect people to actually go to that page. We expect them to go to the parent page that has a PDF, uh, which we think is actually more usable for our end users uh, to get to. I just have to think of an example of where we have one. Uh, where is it? This is probably it. Object. photographs, press release announcing how to use purchase at the Sands Hotel right here. Uh, so we do use the PDF.js uh, viewer, and this isn't even paginated, it's just a single page document, but if it was multiple pages, they would continue down. Uh, one of the reasons being is that in addition to having the OCR in the back end for search, people can download the PDF and we've also connected the OCR to the PDF rather than trying to rely on something like um, Open C Dragon to know both the pagination and also the OCR, we figured this was going to be more usable and we already had a workflow for it uh, to build these before upload. So we're gonna stick with this for a lot of our content, uh, but things like oral histories that are complex objects with both audio and a transcript, uh, we're investigating how best to theme that as well. We also do have objects that are multiple images those are going to use a view, uh, but I don't think we have any in this collection that we've uploaded to the development site. Uh, so I, I should have thought of that. Sorry, Derek, for not planning that far ahead uh, for you. Uh, but what we're essentially planning is having the main image display up here and then a gallery of thumbnails underneath uh, that you can ho hover over and they can uh, repopulate over. But that's still subject to further discussion with our migration team and the UI design process. We have, I think, two options that we're still debating between exactly how we want that to display. But we are using different methods depending on the content and what makes the most sense in that instance. For paged text documents, right now we think PDF is probably going to be the best option for that. And then for photographs that have multiple components are probably going to be the uh, uh, a gallery of thumbnails underneath the master image, the first image. Does anybody have any other questions? I think we might have time for one or two more. All right, well, uh, we have been recording this session and I will be making the recording available on the Island or YouTube channel as soon as I get everything processed. I Hello. will send out, oh. Hi, one more question from Dreshul, <laughs> sorry. Uh, how long did it take for the uh, migration, the whole process? Okay, 
So great question. As I mentioned, we finally decided on our strategy at the very end of 2017. So I started work in earnest, you know, Christmas essentially of 2017. So essentially the beginning of 2018 to this point, we we're initially planning on the two years, we're doing two and a half years. That stated, we did a whole lot of work. A whole lot of that was getting Island Door 8 to where it is right now. So if we we're going to start brand new from right now, we could probably actually do this by our same deadline <laughs> if, mm -hmm. um, in a few months. Uh, but again, a lot of that is going to be uh, remediation of our metadata, right? Mm -hmm. um, technically speaking, this does not take long to implement. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, pause again in case we have one more question before we get to the end. All right, well, I will send out the recording, a link to the recording to uh, everyone who registered so you can watch it again or share it with colleagues who are not able to attend. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thanks for the excellent questions. Uh, and we will have another webinar coming up on February 4th, uh, doing more of a, a base demo of Islander 8 itself, uh, showing off paged content and IIIF manifests and a little bit of versioning control. Uh, so I do encourage you to join us again if those topics interest you. Uh, thank you very much to Seth. Um, that was really, really cool. <laughs> You're very welcome.